Um, I think Fernando Maria has told me that this film was made in a very unusual way with an extraordinary amount of freedom um, in the way that it was shot and in the way that um, you worked together and the, the actors worked together and I was wondering if we could just start by talking about that. Yeah, uh, f uh, Fernando, as, as I'm sure you would have gleaned from seeing City of God is are very oriented towards a uh, as a dynamic camera that gets in and finds a, a real moment. And uh, he, he, one of the first things he seemed to be be intending to do was to take quite a a healthy but literary adaptation of of a Le Carre story, and and churn up find the, the the cinematic dynamic in it, which which sort of means kicking around the dialogue, not being um, uh, overly loyal to some of the writing, but allowing the actors and the moment of filming to sort of dictate the feeling between the actors, the feeling in the room, and certainly scenes between Rachel Weiss and myself in order to establish a believable relationship which has to underpin the story to encourage us to play around and be free with the dialogue, uh, keeping it as it were in the back, of the written dialogue in the back of our heads, but but keeping allowing, giving us the freedom really just to play. And so he shot the film in a very free way, I th I, if I remember correctly, where there was not an elaborate lighting pattern, but where the lighting and the color were worked on later so that there would be more freedom for the actors and more freedom for him. Yes, uh, Fernando's cameraman says our Shalom, I mean, they are a kind of double act, and they, I think they had prepared the movie at length. They had huge discussions about the palette of the movie and the colors, the locations. But I, I think they didn't want to hinder the rhythm of the actors and the energy of a scene or, or the way the actors are existing in a location. So certainly a lot of the ex exteriors you see uh, in Kibera, the big shanty town in, in the northern part of Kenya towards the end of the movie, those you can't afford to hang around. You've got to, all those people are local people who are extras. Their energy, their commitment, their focus, the light, everything. You need to move f fast. I know they have this term guerrilla shooting, but it, it, I think it, it was like that. And, and I found it very, as an actor, um, the energy of that, that speed, a, a good thing. And is this, is this true of the scene, the, 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 your first meeting in the film, the, the scene where you and Rachel Weiss meet at the, um, where you're giving this, delivering the speech, the, the kind of spontaneous feel of it, because it feels very, very alive. Yeah, that was pretty much that's what was written, but um, the, the last bit of it, when I go over to her, mm -hmm. that is a bit improvised about how something like you, you're terrifying or something like that, yeah. <laughs> which she was. <laughs> uh, but I think by that time we'd done a, but Fernando just as a person, as a man, has a wonderfully open quality. So there are some, sometimes, what, even a great directors, you, you know they have a very, a strong intent, which I suppose you could say it's the need to control the, the vision that they have. But Fernando has a wonderful openness about whatever is going to happen, let it happen, which I, I think is probably a more freeing thing for the actor. And that, so even if we're speaking the written lines by Jeffrey Kane, we are in the presence of a director who's saying, yeah, but it's just that I want to feel this emotion, that you are irritated or you like her. So, uh, and of course, in a way, it was a boon The English, he wasn't protective of the text because uh, he understood it, but it was like, yeah, it's just words, like, you, know, you can just play with it. Um, and so that, I think, informed, if, even if it doesn't form a direct alteration in the written dialogue, it informs the way we're being allowed to, to connect with the dialogue. So in the instance of a film like this that's based on a novel, how much does the novel and the character within the novel come into play for you as an actor um, beforehand? Um, how much, you know, as opposed to the script at one stage and then the actual pro moment of filming. In other words, how much does the, the, the character as, in, as he exists in the novel um, come into play for you? 
Well, that was the thing that ma made me want to do it, was reading the book first, because I read, I knew there was a screenplay being developed, and that they, they were about to send it to me. <laughs> but I um, rather presumptuously went and brought the book before. And I loved, I loved Justin. I loved like, what I read on the page. I loved this character. You didn't quite know where he was going when you read the book. Uh, is he maybe a villain? What is he? Is he, is he so weak that he's just going to let it all happen? And, or what? And I kind of admired him. I thought, well, very, I, he, he's a sort of hero, I, or, or protagonist, rather, that I'm, I feel a, a, a kind of affinity with. Um, In what sense? Well, I like the fact that nothing is too overt, that things are kept back inside his head and his heart that he's and you the audience or you the reader are not are having to work to understand him as a man which i think is quite like life that you don't always get someone on a plate when you meet them you have to work to know them and you have to do that with le carre's heroes and actually with graham greens here so i know you're going, you're going to see end of the affair later and I think those, the people have talked about the affinity between Le Carre and Graham Greene, and I think there, there, there is a sort of, who is this person you're being asked to follow? They may seem not very likable, they may have done these terrible things, or they may not be doing enough to make you like them, but there's something about the way that actually Le Carre and Greene write, that they, they make that, um, uh, those questions interesting and dr dramatically plausible. And so I, I, when I read the book, I just loved the way that he was unveiled as a character, slowly, and his gathering strength. You could say, looking from the outside in, I don't know how it sounds to you, but that's a kind of a constant in your career, looking at characters who, are, who actually would fit that description, more or less, who kind of unveil themselves slowly. Yeah, but I think that's... I mean, I think that's what human beings are. I think we aren't a one thing. I think sometimes certain kinds of... Well, I think there are some mo movies which, which are designed to say, there's this person, you know who he is in the first five minutes, and he's going to be like that. He may have one big problem in the middle of the film, and you'll be very clear what it is, and then he'll be fine. Um, and, I, and I think that's... And it's, it's predictable. I mean, I, the best Shakespearean characters are like that. A Hamlet's like that. I mean, is Hamlet weak? Is he actually more angry? Is he mad? Is he not mad? You, you, know, you, have, you have to work, and you don't necessarily get all the answers anyway, but that seems to me like that's who we all are as people. That's, we have to, we don't know, we don't know even who we are as, uh, ourselves. We, I mean, I think that's, I like, I like, when I go to the cinema, I like being challenged by a character and having to um, work to find out who they are. And being challenged by a character when you're playing it. Yeah. And not knowing, you don't, and also going back to your earlier question about Fernando's working method, you don't, that sort of freedom means you don't, you're not in control, you have to sort of just give in to the moment. In fact, she'd just been working with um, Susan Sarandon on a film. She talked, to, she has this wonderful phrase of surrendering. You, you can't, you know, you may have all the thoughts in the world and the, you may have, as it were, the, the emotional design of a character in your head and you intend to portray this. Actually, you, you can't. You, you're, you, you're better off surrendering to the moment with the other actor, with, with, a, with, the, with the director. Of course you have ideas and they may or may not come into play, but I love that, I, that, that idea she has of just, just sur sur surrendering to whatever it is that's going to come out. Have you ever found yourself in a situation on a film where the director is not open to that kind of thinking, where they don't, where they have a very fixed idea that they don't want to deviate from? Uh, yes, I have, but I would, but I would actually, it was a director I really admired, and and he was so specific and so wise in the detail that he offered that I didn't, I didn't feel um, re repressed or 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 somehow. Um, I didn't feel held up by, by that particular director. So I've, I've actually in, well, worked with the, the opposite approach and, and with, in the right person. I mean, I think you, we, you, we, we can read about the great directors who have been incredibly controlling, but because they have such a wise and astute vision, it's, okay, it's, it's great. So I'm, I wouldn't argue for one way over another, but I, I suppose and anyway, the, the director like Fernando that says, be free, try this, try that, try this, try that, then they have, I suppose, in editing, 
and even more complicated tasks because they've created for themselves a, a vast range of possibilities which they have to be incredibly smart about s what, what they select from it. Do you look at films at all during the editing process? Do you look at films at all during the editing process? No. <laughs> uh, do you look at rushes? I, I less and less, less and less I do. I think it's funny, actors looking at rushes. I think that you can you fixate on stuff that's probably not a problem for anyone, anyone else at all. <laughs> my hair is wrong. <laughs> uh, oh, I, mem I remember I walked, my sister Martha did a film called Onyegin based on the Pushkin story. And I went into the editing suite room once. And I said, yeah, but that moment when I'm looking after Liv Tyler, can't you hold it a bit longer? I'm sure there's... An interesting journey in my face when I look. <laughs> yes, Rafe, yes, 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 sure, sure. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> I, I, no. I think I was reading something that you had said where you said you really enjoy the, the, the sensation of losing yourself in the character. And I, when I read that, I was just struck by how often you work and how you must to lose yourself in one character after another in so many projects. How, how does that feel it? Do you feel like you have to zone out in between projects and or is there an overlap sometimes? I think it's a, it's a bit, it's a peculiar when you've been lucky enough to be been offered good roles but people are hungry to make their movies and you don't want to lose the opportunity so you end up trying to immerse yourself in one character after another in quick succession. I think it is, it is exhausting. I think uh, the, Every, every film shoot has a very strong energy because people have struggled hard to make the film and you're sucked into that energy of the commitment to shooting and therefore your own commitment to to being in, inside the role. And I have found the last uh, two years that's been very much the case and it is, it's, um, you can, I don't know, I mean I I once sat down, I was in Moscow and I sat down with a lot of Russian filmmakers, one of, one of whom was the sister of Andrei Tarkovsky and her husband, who was an editor. And they said, Rafe, what are you going to do next? And I said, I think I'm going to take a break. I'm going to recharge my batteries. What? Recharge your batteries? You are only 35. You can recharge your batteries when you're 70. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so they were appalled at this Western decadence of recharging your batteries. <laughs> But does it feel sometimes like there's an overlap from, from one character to another, just in a, in a human way? Not in, imaginatively, in my head it doesn't. I mean, maybe they all might come across the same. <laughs> um, but no, in my head, I very much have a strong sense of that our characters seem very different. I mean, Voldemort and Justin seem quite different to me. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention the character in Wallace and Gromit. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then a different sensation must be when you were playing, I, I think it was Richard II and Coriolanus, yeah. back to back. Yeah. That must have been an interesting <laughs> cocktail. Uh, it's a completely mad thing to try and do. Exciting. Um, in fact, one, one day a week we, we did the two, two roles together. Um, <laughs> uh, I think it was... It was more an athletic challenge than I think it was artistically satisfying for the audience or for the actors. No, it was, it was great. It had a wonderful energy to it, but... Um, no, I think that's... I think that's... Well, that, we're talking about theatre now, but I think that's... I mean, you talk about... Is it... I mean... Uh, my first years working as an actor were in the theatre, in, in repertory companies like the Royal Shakespeare Company, where you are... You are doing three or four roles a week. And there's no kind of worry about, is it too much for you, that the matinee you're playing Edgar in King Lear, and then in the evening you're playing, playing Troilus. You know, you just, you just do it, and that's part of the way it functions. So I suppose in f film it's the same. It's not... Um, in my head, I suppose, I think, well, that's okay. I'll change gear. Um, and I, I, I suppose I, li I, li I like... it's. It can be a bit mad. I mean, just just le being away from home and hotel rooms and locations and the sense of displacement. But in, that's the thing that's more tricky. 
the thing that you've put your um, imaginative and emotional energy into is the role and is the pe other people you're working with. And that, that so, so, so really the answer to your question is I, I don't find it. It's fi I find real life more com complicated than <laughs> being an actor. <laughs> so then if I, I mean there are always different opinions about what kind of separation or lack of lack thereof there is between film acting and, and acting on stage for you does it involve the element of time that you're spending with a character and with the other people is it, is it a different kind of, of rhythm of time for you yes yeah, so the whole working the whole working method is so different i think the actual initial pulse of sort of emotion head imagination i don't think i think that's the same uh but then i think you're dealing with the physical reality of a stage and communicating um, to a group of people in a, like this like now in a present moment so that has a whole for me sitting here now even talking talking to an audience now it's I'm in a sort of continual present thinking about what I'm going to say next and you're receiving it and it's just one removed from speaking a text now and you'd receive it but the film thing is chopped up, and you're, you are aware of the camera and the lens, and the language around you is about the lens and the light and the moment. So it's, um, and I, th my, and I, I, I think film can reveal in that has you know reveals amazing. It gets into the face of an actor and, and the character and shows a lot. But the process of filmmaking um, is not often actor friendly. I just think that the waiting and the chopped up the and waiting. the back to front moments and remembering what you did. We were shooting this scene today, but we shot the thing that happened after two weeks ago. What did I do? Does it matter that I remember what? I mean, it's and you 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 have to analyze a bit about. You have to sort of you have to it's like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle that are spread all around and and you hope that you have a wise director that guides you through it because I think it's sometimes quite quite <laughs> um, it's, it's hard well, the waiting it alone must be a very very difficult tr trial it's it's okay if if it's okay if when you get to do it that there's a real focus and a concentration you just a lot a lot is to do with direct the energy of directors I think is really important of how how they hold the whole thing in their personality in the way they communicate in their assurance in the spirit of who they are, they are the people you depend on as an actor in film. More, in a way, more than in the theatre, you depend on them to pull it all together. And that, that so you've waited, th you know, an hour and a half for a complicated lighting setup. You rehearsed the scene this morning. It felt quite good when you rehearsed it. Now you put on the costume. You've got everything slightly different because they've lit the set, and you come in, and you then you want the director to say, "Okay, don't worry. This is this is how this is going to happen. We're going to shoot that moment there." So you just want to be guided through it, and then I think it can be great. But it's sometimes it can be that you know the machinery of filmmaking, cameras and editing and locations and weather and transport and just stuff just stops stops it flowing. I want to switch gears a little bit and just ask you about playing uh, real people as opposed to fictional creations. You know. T. E. Lawrence and the early film that you made, um, *A Dangerous Man*, Eamon Goth, um, the character in *Quiz Show*. I'm wondering if that, if there's a difference for you, if it feels different to be playing someone who's, who's, who's actually existed as opposed to been a fictional creation. Well, you, you have, you have a, res I guess you have a responsibility, but you have, you certainly, I feel like I can't ignore what there is about what exists about this person like Lawrence of Arabia where it was I mean it was a tiny small film for for uh, UK Channel 4 but already not only was he a real person already there was a, a huge famous cinematic epic about him in Peter O'Toole um, sometimes it can feel it's that especially if someone's well known the expectations are quite quite frightening because everyone has their idea of well especially people like Lawrence of Arabia have their idea or um, less so with Arm Armand Gert I mean in a way I knew very less not many people knew much about him there's a lot actually there's a, a, a material on him if you 
Um, I went to the um, Imperial War Museum in London, and there were all kinds of interesting things about him. Um, but I think actually, in a funny way, whether someone's, if they're real or fictional, if people know, like Heathcliff, people have their sense of Heathcliff, or Hamlet, or famous people, if you any actor who plays Churchill must be, you know, <laughs> they have to deal with so much expectation. So in a way, I suppose I would say it's more freeing when either, if, if it's a real person, they don't know much about him, or it's someone that's just been created, like, like, like in um, The White Countess. That, is, is Which is from that's upcoming, the James Ivory film. Yeah. yeah, that's a character just created by Kazuo Ishiguro, completely original character. So, in a, so that's freeing in a different way. You're saying, or it's not. Well, there's no. Yes, no one. No, no one. I think uh, I love the, the few times that I've played a, a completely original part that no one's read the book of, or no one's read, you know, read the biography of. Uh, that's free because no one has expectations. No one can say, oh yeah, but in the book this, or when you know, that's not that's not correct. Lawrence didn't say that at that moment. Uh, I find it more, and it's a I'm playing playing. Um, Big famous classical parts. You've you've got so much expectation. People possess people in a famous either a, a real a famous real person or a famous fictional role. Everyone has their their sense of especially Hamlet. Hamlet's a killer because everyone knows who that what their Hamlet is going to be. You know, we all know who are, what our Hamlet should be. So how did you find your way into your Hamlet? Um, I just sort of went with my instincts about it. I mean, I. I didn't try to ask, I know, you, you have to, I had a director who said, everyone's going to want to possess Hamlet, and not everyone's going to like you, they all want just, you have to just grab it, and go with it. Ed, <coughs> Ed read that when you were young, you had been really thrilled by recordings of Olivier, yeah. reading Shakespeare, and um, I'm wondering if when you're, when you're playing a character, do you find the voice first, to have an impression that, that you actually find the physical, the, the body of the character before anything else, but I, I could be wrong about that. Uh, yeah, the voice, the voice, but the more and more I like, I'm, it's what they wear <laughs> that I feel uh, helps me. I think it's only an extension of if you, um, you put on clothes, you know, if you, if, you, if you put on formal clothes, we all know what it's like to put on formal clothes to go out, we feel Differently, or we've made, we've gone through the thought process of choosing choosing those clothes. Or anyway, even if we put on sports clothes, we feel differently. But the, the the extension of that is if you start to put on, if you say this is this character, this is the description, and you start to try on different it, different clothes or what your idea of, of that character might be in terms of what they wear, it, you ch you it changes you, um, and you have to connect between your response to an article of clothing and and what you think the character would wear, and the feel of things. I, f I find I c you move differently. Uh, I remember one putting on the, uh, the, the SS uniform for Armand, Armand Gert. That was weird, the weirdest thing. And also stepping, stepping out of the trailer. I was in, in Krakow for the first time. Uh, very peculiar sensation because those cost those those Nazi uniforms were designed to be uh, terrifying and impressive, and, and they gave they and remember feeling a sense of empowerment in in it. Um, and you had to gain quite a bit of weight for that role, also. Huh? I did a bit, yeah. I think it looks more on film. <laughs> I did. <laughs> um. I just wanted to, to talk briefly about the, um, some of the upcoming projects that you have before we turn the questions over to the audience. There's a film that you've just finished and the director's here tonight called Land of the Blind. I just you know, wondered if you wanted to talk about that a little bit. Well, this is um, uh, an independent project by a first-time writer-director, uh, Bob Edwards. Uh, it came to me, and I was blown away by the writing of it. It's a, I, I keep saying it's, an, it's a Kafka-esque political satire. <laughs> but actually it's more than that. It's actually a very, it's a very, it's a very astute, funny, and quite dangerous look at the, the sort of cycle of political extremes from so-called 
communism, fascism, well, the, I mean, all the labels you would care to throw at it, but it, it's a sort of, in a way, I would call it, a, I, I know Bob's here, so I hope I'm not describing it in a way that he doesn't like, but it's, it's, a, sort of politi it's a sort of fable about political extremes. But the writing of it, and uh, cinematically, the writing of it, I thought I'd, I hadn't read anything like it. Um, and we made it in five or six weeks, the beginning of this year in, in England, with, with Donald Sutherland and uh, a wonderful actor called Tom Hollander, who you may have seen playing the slimy priest in Pride and Prejudice. Um, but this is, I, I think the film is, I mean, I, w I would say this, wouldn't I? But I think it's really an exciting piece of work. Um, and then it occurs to me what you were just saying about um, the clothes that a character wears, uh, that for the white countess, where the character that you play is blind, mm. the feel of the clothing and, and, and movement must have been different. There must have been a different kind of process, a different kind of experience. Yeah, I mean, playing, if you have vision, it's, I think playing blind is, to be denied your vision at length is something that even if you're playing blind, it's very hard to really get your head around. This is a character, if you haven't seen it, it's a, it's a, it's a man who has seen, who's lost his sight um, in, a, in, a, in a bomb explosion. But he's described as being very, very uh, independent, hates to be seen as a victim of his handicap. He's determined to get around uh, with minimal help. And I ask, in England we have a, 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 um, an institution called the Royal National Institute for the Blind, and they, are, they want to help awareness of blind, blind people. So when, when they're approached by actors, they're pretty helpful. And they were, in my case, they introduced me to a man who had had vision and who was very aggressively independent despite being blind, and I really based the performance pretty much on him. This is someone who could had an uncanny sense of a physical space, could really uh, hear what surfaces he was passing, if he was walking past a, pe a wooden surface or concrete or glass, he could identify the sounds of different car engines, and he would uh, locate your voice and, 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 and almost look at you, but not quite. Um, and so it was quite, he really was on top of it, and I really just based, I just based the, pretty much the, the blindness on, on him. No, no questions, does anyone? Yes. The question is, when is White Countess going to come out nationwide? It's December 21st, isn't it? I think, yeah. Yeah, next week or two, two weeks' time. Yeah. Do you, do you, should I repeat the question? Yeah, yeah, I, I can repeat the question if you want. <laughs> we can, we can take turns. Okay. <laughs> it's a general comment about how much you enjoyed her, his performance as Justin Quayle and um, how he should receive an Academy Award. I agree, but then <clears throat> the question is about your upcoming role in the film adaptation of Faith Healer and whether or not you're going to do it. Well, not or no, no, it's a stage, it's a stage, stage play. Okay. Of a, of Brian, Brian Friel play, play Faith Healer. And whether or not you're going to do an Irish broke? Well, the answer is that I met Brian Friel recently in Dublin and asked him specifically about the accent because Frank Hardy c comes from Limerick. Brian actually is nervous of too thick an accent or strong brogue, as you call it. So I'm, I think at the moment I'm intending to have a, the lightest of Irish accents because I think that he doesn't want someone doing an accent and then getting in the way of what's being said. But I will have something that I hope is recognizable as an Irish lilt, which, I, which I'm, I'm practicing. 
<laughs> there was also a comment about about your performance in the new Harry Potter film, and I think and <laughs> I think I read that you had said that you were very skeptical about doing it until you saw the costumes that you were going to get to wear. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> you know, Harry Potter's had been around a bit, been around the block a bit. Um, but a Mike Newell who directed it showed me these drawings of the character and then that sort of swayed me because I thought they were weird and spooky and interesting and he kind of seduced me really. <laughs> I don't, I'm not aware of there being a strong response. I did hear earlier on when the film was getting a lot of publicity just after it had come out that someone working for a pharmaceutical company or represent, or someone, someone in Washington who had interest with Big Pharma called one of the critics, a leading critic, don't ask me who, and said, by the way, what this film is saying is all rubbish. So that was quite interesting, but I think that's, that's gone away. I mean, I... Um, I mean, I think the film takes a, in a very extreme idea. I mean, this has happened where drug companies have distributed drugs that have had bad side effects, and they have sort of turned a blind eye to it. I think there's more, there's more complicated issues about availability of actually quite effective drugs, which the film doesn't show. I think there are, there's all kinds of, sort of mysterious, shady things about pharmaceutical companies, how they operate, how much do they perpetuate drugs that stall diseases as opposed to cure them, because there's more to be made out of a, a drug that, you know, stalls something rather than cures it. But I think the principle, from, from what I do know about, the, the big concerns about pharmaceutical companies are the availability of drugs, not the abuse of, of, of people's ignorance about a drug. a question about um, Rafe's training in the theater and how it prepared him for film and, and a question about whether he plans to return to the stage, which has actually just been answered since you're going to be doing the faith healer. Yeah, I'm returning to the theater. It's actually, this lady's question earlier. I'm returning to, in Dublin doing this Brian Friel play faith healer starting in the spring and coming here in April. Um, I went to, to my Training started at RADA, which is a Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London, which was basically a theatre training. At that time, it was run very much that each intake, each group of students, was considered like an ensemble, like a company. You were tra it, was only, it was only seven terms, which was less than the th three years. And uh, y you had classes in, in, in voice and movement, well, on text, on classical texts. And then in your last two or three terms, you started putting on full productions of plays. So the whole thing was geared to you being an ensemble putting on plays in rep. There was, and I think it might have been a fault, there was very little in the course, or nothing in the course about working for a camera, nothing at all. And the principal then, who's a wonderful man, I think he thought, you know, you will learn that, because he believed essentially that, that the, me the, so the mechanism of the actor's imagination was the same, whether it was theater or film. But it was very much oriented towards theater. And then when I left that academy, I, I worked mostly, only in the theatre for about five years in reper repertory companies, starting in uh, the open air theatre in Regent's Park, London, which does very sort of earthy, direct Shakespeare, to a couple of seasons in provincial rep theatres, and then coming into the National Theatre and the Royal Shakespeare Company, where the, tra the training really is just about doing it over a, a lengthy season, doing, as I was saying earlier, doing, you know, juggling three parts in one season. Um, and watching wonderful, very experienced older actors. Um, so when I went to the National, I was lucky enough to be in a company with actors, I don't know if you know them, but in, um, Alec McCowan and Richard Pascoe, a wonderful, great actress called Barbara Jefford, and a wonderful actor called Robin Bailey, uh, who were fantastic, great, great theatre actors. Um, and so just being in a company with them was, was, was training enough in a way. Just what, being able to watch, watch the, what they did. But you said that there was no 
preparation for appearing on camera, did you feel like you had to go through a process to prepare yourself to be on camera? Was that an ongoing education for you? Yeah, no, I think you keep learning about it. I mean, I think to be um, this camera, the camera's always so present as an actor, so it moves around and the, everything that's being, the, what, what direct, the director is saying is all about this shot does this, we've got to see, turn around on you, turn around on her. Um, I find the biggest challenge is trying to not, not be, to sort of be, to lose my awareness of the camera. Because I think, I don't know, I, I like the idea that you are totally present with the other actor and the camera just records it. And of course there is all this technique, you know, about the camera and, you know, I mean, I, don't, I just don't, you can get into a whole thing about what's my good side, my bad side, lie me like this, or, you know, what's the camera doing, is this, I mean, I work with an actor, is this a 75, is it a 50 lens, what is it? You know, is it here, is it here, is it, you know. Um, and that's, and I think there's a place for that, like, just so you know how you're being shot, but I, I, would, hate, I would hate that to become, I, I like to just try to, the idea that you play the scene with someone, you lose yourself in the present moment with, I think Rachel and I did, did, I did feel there were moments between us when we were just free in the way we connected with each other. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> The question is, what is it like to play Doris Duke's butler in the new movie with the, making now with Susan Sarandon? Or is it the film that you've just made? Or that you're no, this is a film I just finished. I mentioned working with Susan earlier. Um, and I play the butler, who you may or may not know, but he, when she died, uh, he was left, con a large, uh, he left, left in control of her, her money. He, he was a beneficiary of some, a few million dollars, but actually he was in control of a whole foundation and there was a huge scandal about it. Did he, did he hasten her on her way? Because he had sole access to her in her last days of her life. Um, but we, our film really it doesn't come down judging him or her. It's really trying to show the relationship between the two of them, what that might have been. And I think the, f the film feels that maybe they were two people who were drawn to each other and that he wanted to care for her and she m needed someone to care, to be, to care for her. Um, I'm not going to say much more about it. <laughs> but he was, he was Irish. I mean, I did a, a, he, he was from Donegal and I definitely attempted a, Don, a Donegal accent for that. I did. <laughs> comment about Riff's performance in The White Countess and the way that he um, played, well, the, 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 the way that he, his character embodied blindness um, in the film. And then there's a question about what's he going to do next in the way of Shakespeare. I, I, I don't know. We could do what? something right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. There are a bunch of, of Shakespeare roles I'd like to do, but nothing, nothing that I've I'm setting up, or no one's asked me to do. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I. This is a question about the production of Julius Caesar that was done in, in, in London last spring, and was it videotaped? Or yeah, I'm sure it was. Recording I'm almost certain. I believe that there is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you.
This is a question about Onegin, which was very much a family affair directed by Rafe's sister, scored by his brother. And you've since made another film with her, Chromophobia. You know? And so, th and then the, the, what was it like to work together as a family? And is everyone still speaking? No, we're, no, we are speaking. Um, but it was a funny, the genesis of that film was, was, was peculiar. I mean, I remember having the idea for, I read Onegin when I, the, the librarian at the Royal Academy at Radig said, you should read this role. He often would give out not only plays, but novels where he thought an actor might find something in the character they could respond to. Um, just to get the actor's brain thinking about their casting and what would appeal to them, just to get, and to e sort of educate them as well. And I remember being given this, reading this Pushkin in translation and being fascinated by this character, which, um, I mean, this, the, and Yegin, forgive me if you know this, but in Russia it's, it's iconic. It's Pushkin, it's like Romeo and Juliet in Shakespeare's canon is to English language. It's huge. It's, it's almost sacred. It has a religious stature, almost. Um, but anyway, I, I came to Martha with, I suppose I had already thought it, it would be great to have more control over a film that I was making, or to have some say or influence or a guiding factor in a, in a piece of filmmaking. But I didn't, I knew I wanted to play the part and not to direct it, but I suppose it was a kind of nepotism, must have been nepotism, that I, <laughs> that I went because I thought I'd trust my sister. And I liked what she was shooting then um, music videos, and I liked, I liked what she was doing. Um, and so we just started quite informally talking about it, and then, you know, I think because of the success of a film like English Patient, people were able to t entrust funds to <laughs> Eugene, the making of Eugene and Yegin. Um They did it a little warily, I think, um, but it did motor on. Uh, from from that, and I was supported by wonderful, you know, wonderful representatives and agency and people who encouraged it to happen, um, make it happen. But it was it was the weird, the most. I mean, it was it was we we did talk to each other. We were very very. It was it was trying. It was a test of. Um, but I think we were crea creatively and imaginatively very much in sync in it. But the most. The, the th whenever I think of that, I think of when we took the film to Russia, where we had a very interesting, controversial response. Because there are things in it that would appall, appall Russian purists, which, um, in a way, I, I quite I see that they do. They see what they would, but it was an interesting cultural um, just meeting because you know we had thought we were trying to truthfully represent this story, but of course we only came to it through English translations and uh, um, of, of great poem. It's a great piece of poetry, Onegin in Russian. And I think they felt a bit, some, they wanted to like it, they respected our intent, but I think they saw that it wasn't their Onegin. And some people, and other, other Russian r critics and writers and people were very generous. And, but it was, it was extraordinary meeting Doing just that, just it just threw up so many things about when, when does a culture possess, you know, how much should do do you know, does England possess Shakespeare? I mean, or it, they, they all these. I always, I would always say, you know, why are you so possessive? You know, we don't feel we own it. You can't own it. But they, they, there was a strong sense that this is our classic and. And what are you doing with it? And and, and then the other side of that was, you know, well, we are so grateful. You, we like that you're making it. You, that you're interested. Not you're, not that you're we're grateful, but we're interested in. It was, and the thrill of shooting in in St. Petersburg. That was um, the funny. The 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 first day of shooting, um, the night before, because you you go to Russia, you want snow. For St. Petersburg. I mean, you do want those images. And the night before we started shooting in St. Peter, we were only there for five days, and we had to shoot all these key key sites to sell it as being authentically Russian. And as we went to bed the night before, the snow started falling. And I woke up, and of course, there it was. And then I had a call time, separate from, I think they'd gone off, the rest of the crew and Martha had gone off, they'd gone off to shoot some scenes without any actors, just images. 
and I'd been assigned two Russian bodyguards uh, to take me in a funny van with thick pile carpeting and a, a defunct hi-fi system <laughs> to take me to the set. And uh, they, they didn't speak a word of English, so we nodded at each other, very, very friendly. And they took me down the Nevsky Prospekt. And suddenly this van, it cl clapped out, it broke down. And I didn't have a word of Russian, and I had to get to this location to play Yevgeny and Yegin on the first day of filming. <laughs> and eventually they, 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 they hailed, as you do, you, they hailed a, ta a taxi, but there aren't, ta there aren't official taxis, there are just men in cars who stop for you, and you just... <laughs> You, you, you discuss the fee, and they, they discuss the fee, and I got into the car, and I remember the smell of diesel and Russian pop music and strong Russian cigarette smoke, and this guy delivering me <laughs> to the set, he did. And uh, half an hour later, I was in the top hat and the flowing cape, and <laughs> but it was just a weird uh, sort of juxtap con 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 contrast of you know, the real Russia and then the sort of romantic liter literary Russia that we were attempting. <laughs> Don't you have an upcoming project based on Dostoevsky? No. Okay. That's off. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there was that night. <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we need to just summarize the question. <laughs> I think everyone heard it somehow. So. <laughs> How real was it with Kristen Scott Thomas and the English patient? That's a funny question. <laughs> well, it helps if there's a degree of attraction. And there was, I think, on that film. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's funny. Um, the love, the the whole question about love scenes and, and intimacy and desire is very because so much. In fact, just to completely sidestep your question a sec for a second, like, because working with D Donald Sutherland on Land of the Blind, I wanted to ask him about the famous scene in Don't Look Now with Julie Christie, and that and apparently they did it. <laughs> no, but I said apparently you did it, didn't you, Donald? You did it. No, 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 we didn't do it. It was all, it was all apparently, you know, each shot was very, very carefully set up by Nick Rogue. And they were in a tiny room with a camera. It was uncomfortable. It all exists in the editing. Um, and I think there's a, it's a funny mix. I mean, I think you, you, you certainly helps if you like the person. It can help if you're attracted to them. I suppose if you're really attracted to them, it could be quite problematic. <laughs> but, uh, only, uh, <laughs> uh, so I think you just, a sense of humor, you know, little bits of bodies close to each other under a kind of lens and you want to just have, it's hot and people sweat and makeup runs and <laughs> clothes fall open at the wrong moment and so you just want to have a sense of humor about it. Um, and, a dire and again, the director things, so a director that Anthony Mingella were the first um, there were, uh, there's a scene where we're um, making love in a back room while people are singing Christmas carols up against a wall. And I remember Anthony being very, very specific about what happens if we see your hand do this and it comes here and then we see this. So he just took it, took it stage by stage to pieces. And then funnily enough, by doing that, he took the curse off it. And then when we actually got to, I guess, the shot at it happening, we were, we were in it, and you, you know, you, it's not that hard to replicate. I mean, there are harder things. <laughs> Have you ever had a director try to manipula manipulate you in your relationship with one of your fellow actors to, towards greater affection or towards animosity to, you know, create tension to explore a dynamic in the movie? No, I've heard about directors mani manipulating uh, situations to get a response, I don't. I've never, I haven't felt that ever. Someone sort of playing mind games, I've never had that.
the question is for all those fans out there who would like to travel to, to see Rafe do Shakespeare on stage, but who may not be able to, is he thinking about doing Shakespeare on film? And what would the role be? Well, I don't know if it would, it would be, it would be a very hard sell, but the Shakespeare that I, I think could be a strong film could be Coriolanus. Um, it's a very hard and, 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 and unforgiving play. But I think just the scope of it, and um, in terms of armies, and I mean, I just think that visually, it could be very strong. But that's the only play that only play of Shakespeare's that I've env env envisioned being a movie. But whether I, I don't know where to take it from just being a good idea. <laughs> I think I think I think Shakespeare. I mean, I think you have to. It's hard. I think it's hard to do it really. Well, how much you cut, or how, how you know, I, 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 um, I, th I think it's probably got to be. I'd, I'd, I'd like to do it with someone, a director, or some, or a partner, one way or another, who would, who would, who would not be too um, pr precious about it. Because I think it would have to be cut, cut aggressively and st have strong idea behind it. Maybe. You all heard that question. Mm. Oh, oh. The question is about <laughs> the question is about the experience of shooting the Constant Gardener on location in Africa, and how much did it affect Rain's Rafe personally, and uh, how much did it affect his performance? Well, it's impossible to go to some uh, some of the places we went to and not be affected. I mean, you know, these are communities of people. I'm thinking primarily of Kibera and the northern part of Kenya, where we shot the the end of the film. Where you know what people they have people have nothing by our standards. Um, so a child is delighted to receive a, a bottle like this. They're thrilled, even if it's empty. They're thrilled. Um, so you're completely you have to readjust your whole sense of what's what. Uh, but at the same time that you might be appalled or moved or feel guilty, which is kind of the thing to get over in a way, because you want to do something, but also you, I find it in the, the sort of the dignity and the humor and the warmth of the people the most inspiring thing, because they, they, they exist and they have existed for hundreds of years despite high mortality rates and disease, and of course now AIDS. But they, the people we met on the film mostly had the most extraordinary vitality and human dignity and the need to engage with you in the most simplest human way. So I've, in, in a way that might surprise you, I found it uplifting in many ways. And an um, example of that would be our rap party in Loyengalani, where we shot that, the sequence of the raid on the village that you see at the end. Mostly we were working with people from that area. All the extras you see that are running and, and crying for help or carrying the goods from the airplane, they're all people who live there. Not, they're not professional uh, film people at all. But they completely were supportive of us and our producer talked to their elders of the tribe and got their agreement and did, did, did I think, you know, a proper negotiated honorable deal with them. But the rap party was the most extraordinary occasion where they came in to the compound where most of us were, were living and they did these wonderful traditional dances and wanted us to join in. Um, and it was, it was the most wonderful meeting of, 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 of cultures and being really embraced. So despite all the, the terrible things that one could list, you know, about lack, lack of medical care, lack of education, there's a, there's a sort of human spirit that, that really thrilled me and moved me and I suppose humbled me too. And I think we all felt I think I think we all felt that. Yeah, I'm waiting for the comedy <laughs> offer. <laughs> no, and it doesn't come. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
And the other part, of, the other question is, who were who are some of your favorite actors? Um, well, I have a whole. Um, I love. I mean, I love performances. I suppose more than more than actors. I mean, I've, an actor that excited me in the theatre when I was young was Paul Schofield. Um, I, mean, I love a whole crop of great American movie actors. But, you know, I love Gene Hackman. I love Robert Duvall. Uh, in the past, British actors that I love, I love Trevor Howard. I love James Mason. Um, I love Charles Lawton. Um, yeah, I mean, a, a whole range of of, of people. Um, of course, Brando, of course. But I love, I love, I love watching all actors work. Actually, I'm always, I love going to the theatre and just being. I love watching, watch, watching what happens when actors act. Um, and, as, and I love finding that person who has a small part at the side of the stage and just does that little simple thing, and it's just mesmerising. And I love, I love, I love looking at the actors and you know that are undiscovered. So, what was the experience of playing Paul Schofield's son like for you? It was uh, extraordinary, and I, I, I couldn't believe it because my mother had always told me, said to me, you know. Of course, these great actors, there's Olivier and there's Gilgood, and, but there's also Schofield, as she said, <laughs> Schofield. And she had a, and I guess I had this memory of my mother sort of somehow putting him aside as being somehow something other, something unique, something, uh, something that he wasn't so much in the limelight as the famous British theatre actors, but there was something about him. Uh, and so when Robert Redford said, we're approaching Paul Schofield for the part, I was very moved and I think quite excited. Well, I was emotional, I think. Um, I was a very private man. One was simple, no fuss, just would sit and wait very quietly and um, listen to the director and no fuss. I just remember someone with great dignity and simplicity and um, it was, a, a, I mean, the part required that he had this wonderful sort of old world dignity about him. Uh, a highly cultivated man, Mark Van Doren. But the Schofield that I had seen on stage in, in, in another co context was in Sa Salieri and Amadeus, where I, I had that thing that people talk about when they go to the theater and they say they feel their hairs rise up on the back of their neck. And that's what I experienced when I saw Paul Schofield on stage. I just was, I remember sitting, I was enjoying the play, I thought it was okay, but suddenly this thing happened and I can remember sitting there thinking, Christ, what, this is something other that's coming across. And it happens very rarely, but that, I must remember it. I can sort of remember the sensation of it. He was having a soliloquy to God about, uh, why have you done this to me, God? This man, this Mozart, who is he? And I, it was an appeal to God about why, why this unjustness? Um, and I just remember this extraordinary voice and this amazing, sort of amazing. Another thing I remember, I've seen Schofield, Paul Schofield play uh, Oberon in the Midsummer Night's Dream in the small theater at the National, where when Puck and Oberon go to watch the lovers quarrel, there was a small audience raked up, and he just went to the audience, he just went like that as he approached, and they walked, he and Puck, well, I think he walked in and sat in the audience, but I remember he just sort of did that gesture, and the audience, they all, they all people moved aside to let him in. <laughs> How extensive was your research for the role in, in Spider, the David Cronenberg film, and what was it like to immerse yourself in that character? Um, he, he was meant to be a, schiz a man suffering from schizophrenia, so I met, I met people who suffered from schizophrenia, but they weren't ever going to be Spider, because what was created by Patrick McGraw was a very particular, rather extreme person, a spirit. Um, but it was helpful to meet them and talk to them, and some of them were very open about their condition. Um, there was one man I met who I think I sort of, I, I, I hate to say I based it on him, because I didn't, but it was something to do with about being, being very hard to understand, and he was in another world, and he, he, he spoke, it was a peculiar slurred thing that when he spoke it was 
odd. And the, the, the man who worked with him, the psychiatrist, could understand him. I couldn't understand him. And I suppose I, I, that gave me the idea for this man with this continual monologue going on, which you don't get to hear. You hear sort of a mumbling thing occasionally, maybe about only four lines in the whole film are perhaps audible. Um, but I get all this information on schizophrenia and I went to meet people who suffer from it, but David Cronenberg, I think, was quite right, saying don't go down that hole of, or that, that road of trying to portray schizophrenia accurately because we have to have our spider, we have to have this, this person, this creature. So that was very much a sort of instinctive thing, mostly. And, then, and, another, and the thing that was really helpful to me was reading Samuel Beckett's monologues. Because I thought there was an affinity between Patrick's character as Spider and, and some of Beckett's characters. I think that that's all the time that we have for tonight. We need to wrap it up. But thank you very, very much, Rafe, for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.